Hello everyone and welcome back to GLB Productions. My name is Bruno Luce, thanks for joining me. In this video, I'd like to do a review of this pedal, the new for 2017 Zoom AC2 Acoustic Creator. Now, normally I'll wait a while before I post a review of some of these products. I've only had this pedal for about a week, but I've been so impressed that I thought I'd get this video out there for you to evaluate. Now, before we begin, I need to say, this is going to be a long video and we're going to cover many different aspects, both of acoustic modeling as well as this particular pedal. Now, not everyone's going to be interested in watching the whole thing, so if you'd like to skip ahead, please look in the description box below and I will post bookmarks to each individual section so that you can jump around and watch what you are most interested in. Having said that, let's proceed. So to begin with, a brief history of the acoustic modeling concept. Now, we've known for a long time that the best way to amplify an acoustic instrument is by using a microphone. And acoustic musicians have known this ever since the first PA systems came into widespread use. Unfortunately, in a live performance context, microphones have significant issues when it comes to working with acoustic instruments. To begin with, if a microphone is stand mounted, the instrument and the player are tied to one position on stage. And as a result, they can't move around and have the same kind of interaction with the audience and dynamic performance that could, say, a singer. There are clip-on microphones and wireless microphones that try and get around this problem. However, there are also significant issues regarding feedback as well as the problem of bleed, right? A microphone cannot distinguish between something that the player wants to be picked up, like the sound of their instrument, and sound that is just ambient, especially the sound of acoustically powerful sources such as drums, electric guitars, bass guitars, etc. So since, believe it or not, the 1930s, acoustic musicians have been installing pickups into their instruments. The earliest pickups were magnetic, right? So basically the same concept as an electric guitar pickup just installed in an acoustic instrument. And these would apply to the pickups such as those designed by Lloyd Law from the Vivitone company and Harry Diamond's FH or FHC pickups designed for archtop guitar. The trend of using magnetic pickups on acoustic guitars continued in the 1950s with designs such as the Gibson J160E uh, used by the Beatles during their television appearances. In the early 1970s, the Ovation Company, well known for their round-backed fiberglass-bodied acoustic guitars, introduced the first production under saddle piezo pickup system. Now this system used crystals which converted vibrations from the guitar's top into electrical signals that could be amplified. And then in the late 1970s, the Japanese company Takamine produced the six element palathetic pickup system, which in my opinion and in the opinion of a lot of gigging musicians is the best piezo-based system available today. So you have magnetic pickups, you have piezo pickups, and you have hybrid pickups that attempt to combine them together. All of these pickup systems have one common issue. They don't sound like a microphone. Allow me to demonstrate. So here we have an acoustic guitar it happens to be a Takamine EF360GF, a lovely dreadnought, spruce top, rosewood back and sides. Let's see how it sounds on a microphone. We have a microphone here. This happens to be an Audio-Technica AE3000.
And now let's see how the pickup sounds. For this, we're going to be running the guitar through this DI box with all of the modeling bypassed. So as you heard from our demonstration there, the pickup in this guitar, although it's one of the best pickup systems available today, does not sound like a microphone. It has a very noticeable mid-range quality that clearly sets it apart from the microphone. I, I think that acoustic musicians have come to accept this sound of a pickup as being quite legitimate, right? You hear that sound and your brain automatically says, okay, that's an acoustic guitar, right? Even though, as we've just seen from this comparison, it actually doesn't sound anything like an acoustic guitar. It sounds like a pickup installed in an acoustic guitar. So where does this leave us? Well, for quite a while now, manufacturers have been offering various bits of kit to make your pickup sound like a microphone. And the way that we know this is by the type of language that they use when they describe their products. Now, I personally encountered these types of devices in the early 2000s with units such as the Boss 85 and the 88. The 85, which is relatively unknown actually, had body and ambience controls, as you can see from this picture, and claimed to, quote, turn the brittle, sterile sounds of a piezo pickup into the rich, airy sound of a mic'd acoustic guitar. So even back then, they were already using this kind of language. The 88, released in 2003, went one step further and offered Roland's composite object sound modeling, which, quote, converts the output from piezo pickups to the sound of a real acoustic guitar as captured by a high quality microphone. Now, this particular unit, which in my opinion was quite ahead of its time, actually had six specific guitar models captured by three specific microphones, two Martins, two Gibsons, one Guild, and one Ramirez classical guitar. Zoom's first attempt to do this was the Zoom A3 released in 2013 and accompanied by much of the same type of language. Quote, pickups have a tendency to make the sound flat and lifeless, while microphones often introduce feedback. So, as you can see, the companies are aware of the issue, right? They are aware that, number one, pickups don't sound like microphones, but on the other hand, microphones have problems, right? You have the problem of bleed, feedback, and being stuck in one uh, space on stage. So fast forward to today, we have the Zoom AC2. And I hope that this little history will help you understand what all of these pedals are trying to achieve. They're trying to make your pickup sound like a microphone without all of the associated drawbacks and disadvantages. So now after that rather lengthy preamble, let's get into the unit itself. I just like to show you the box that the unit comes with. As you can see, um, presentation is very nice. And when you open this up, aside from your manuals and everything, it also comes with the power supply, which is really, really good. And um, congratulations to Zoom for doing that. Uh, there are too many manufacturers, Boss especially, who make you pay extra for a power supply. And the power supplies are not cheap. With this one, it's included, so you're up and ready to go. Now let's talk about the physical characteristics of the unit. Unit weight is 570 grams or 9.5 ounces without batteries. And as you can see from this little comparison here, 
It's a little bit bigger than a standard Boss pedal. This is the Boss 82, uh, reviewed separately on this channel. The exact dimensions of the unit are 157 by 104 by 43 millimeters. These I measured myself. Um, Zoom does not actually give this information in the spec sheet. The case of the unit is plastic, but it's about three millimeters thick and it seems pretty durable so far. Input and output sockets are metal. The foot switches at the bottom here appear to be plastic, but they have a solid feel and a positive engagement. Now, as you can see, the unit has this contour to it, right? Meaning that it goes down here and back up here. So as a result, these foot switches are at quite of an angle. And I think the logic behind that is that when you put your foot on the ground, if your heel is in front of the unit, your foot is sort of at an angle. Uh, I'm not sure if this will suit all players. The build quality of Zoom pedals, in my opinion, has never been as good as that of the Boss pedals, right? The Boss pedals have always had this really, really rock-solid, tank-like feeling. And the Zooms have always felt a little bit plasticky, a little bit flimsy, in my opinion. However, this does feel like it's well-built. Having said that, of all the controls on the front of the unit, this rotary switch here, which is used to select the preset for the modeling, is not impressive. The feel of this is really quite vague and the detent is too soft in my opinion. I found that when I was first using it, it was much too easy to skip over detents and end up parked between two of them. At the same time, as you can see, this indicator is symmetrical and there's only a very small indentation to show you which end is the actual indicator. That plus the fact that it just rotates continuously with no hard stops means that live, it's very, very difficult to see which preset you are actually on. I don't know why Zoom didn't make this in the shape of an arrow or, or give a bigger indicator to show what preset you are actually on. In practice, if I was gonna use this in a low light condition, I'd paint a big orange dot on the end that was the indicator uh, to guide me. Also, as you can see from this, there are a huge bunch of settings cluster around this dial. So the end result is that it's quite difficult to tell which one you're on, especially if they sound similar. So with me, I tend to find myself counting stops, right? Rather than actually relying on the physical, uh, the pointer there. The other dials on the front of the unit are solid, right? The EQ, the reverb, the volume, etc. The EQ dials here, right, have a good positive center detent. The others do not, nor do they require it. All of them feel like they are really will stay put and will not get turned accidentally. The pickup switch, which is used to select whether you're on piezo, magnetic or bypassed, is black on black and as a result, it's quite hard to see. Fortunately, this is not something that you need to change often. Now, going back to this curved shape, it means that the these knobs here are easy to see, but when the unit is on a desktop, the tuner section, which is on a reverse slope, for want of a better word, um, is actually uh, difficult to read, okay? Again, when it's on the floor, it's not an issue. The LEDs for the tuner, the anti-feedback, mute and boost switches are all nice and bright, right? So as you can see, there's the tuner and there's the mute, right? All nice, bright, easy to see. Now let's discuss inputs and outputs. The unit has one input and three outputs. On the right side of the unit, you can see you have one quarter inch input. The input impedance is 10 meg ohms, so will handle unbuffered piezo pickups just fine. 
Also on the right side of the unit is a micro USB port which is used to update the firmware in the unit and can also power the unit in desktop applications. I don't think it's a good idea to power it on stage using the USB because the connector doesn't lock and is rather fragile. That plus the fact that they give you the normal power supply which plugs in to the back. On the left side of the unit, you can see there are two outputs. There is a mono output which doubles as a headphone jack and a second output that acts as the right channel when stereo output is desired. As you can see for this demo, I've got them both hooked up. The headphone amplifier, which is built into the left quarter inch output, is, in my experience, nothing great. It worked well enough on my Sony earbuds, but any attempt to connect a professional series of headphones, such as my Bayer Dynamic DT770s, uh, resulted in a sound that was really quite bright and not very loud. It's also important to note that there is no separate headphone volume control. The output depends on the main volume control on the front panel. So I think this headphone output is designed for home or on the road practice rather than professional studio or stage use. On the back panel, you have the power switch, which has three positions, off, on, and eco. In the eco position, the unit will switch itself off after 10 hours of not being used. Next to that is the socket for the included power supply, as well as the ground lift or connect switch, which allows you to lift pin one of the XLR output, mainly for the purpose of defeating ground loops. Then you have the XLR output with its pre or post switch. When set to pre, the XLR functions as would the output on a standard active DI box. None of the controls on the front affect it. The output level is fixed, modeling and tone controls are bypassed, and it is unaffected by the tuner mute. There's two important uses for this pre-mode. First of all, as a standard transparent DI box. This is a useful feature to have, especially if you're using the unit to record a dry track for later use, for example, in reamping or something else. Secondly, as I've got it set up here, to be used in conjunction with the stereo unbalanced outputs. Now, as a sound engineer, I notice that musicians in general, myself included, tend to put too much reverb on their instruments. And the reason for this is that it sounds nice, right? It's the same reason why vocalists like a lot of reverb in their monitor mix. Also, when you're on stage and at most six feet from your amplifier or monitors, the sound of the room is minimized. However, this amount of reverb can be problematic for the front of house engineer who often has to contend with less than ideal room acoustics and an audience who are much further away from the front of house loudspeakers. As a result, it's thus often important to the front of house engineer to have a dry version of the acoustic guitar, which can then be blended in with the effected signal to give a result that is appropriate for the mix in that particular venue. Now, the normal way of doing this is to put a standard DI box before the musician's effects to capture the original tone of the guitar. The output of this DI box would then be run into the musician's pedal board or multi-effects unit and the output of that unit run into a separate channel on the mixing console. With this unit, you actually can run the XLR output in the pre-mode and then connect the quarter inch outputs to a stereo DI box to give you the best of both worlds. Now let's discuss the front panel of the unit. At the top, we have the source guitar knob and this is the modeling preset that you want. The presets are grouped relatively logically for the most part. So to begin with, 
uh, if we go from the 12 o'clock position, you have four Martin type presets. You have Dreadnought, OM, Triple O, and Double O. These are all modeled off of various Martin guitars. After that, you have YMH, which is designed for Yamaha jumbo type guitars, such as the LL series. Silent is for silent guitars, mainly from Yamaha, as well as any acoustic type guitar that does not have a body per se. You then have a 12 string preset. You have a nylon string preset. Right at the bottom, mold refers to molded um, guitars such as those from Ovation. You then have two specialized presets. You have one for upright bass and one for resonator or Dobro style guitars. Single cutaway is designed for single cutaway guitars such as those made by Taylor. This is probably the most mysterious of all the presets. You then have four Gibson presets. You have Parlor, designed for the Gibson L series, Jumbo, designed for the Gibson SJ series, square and round shouldered dreadnoughts. According to the manual, square shoulder is for guitars such as the Gibson Hummingbird and round shoulder is for guitars such as the Gibson J series. Now, it's very important to note that although the presets are based on specific types of guitars, there is nothing preventing you from using any preset with any guitar. And this is one of the great things about the AC2. It's a bit like a set of tonal palettes that you can choose from depending on your mood, time of day, etc. Now let's discuss the pickup switch that you can see here. This small switch applies a small amount of preset EQ to match the unit to the type of pickup that you are using. In the off position, it's bypassed, meaning there is no pre-EQ to the signal. In the magnetic and piezo positions, there is a small amount of EQ. Now, I don't have any guitars that use a magnetic pickup system, so I haven't used the magnetic position. The piezo position gives a small amount of mid-range cut as well as a small amount of high frequency attenuation. And this mirrors the type of EQ that I personally would apply to a piezo pickup equipped guitar. Um, so, you know, this idea that you cut the mid-range and cut the treble a little bit just to make the pickup sound a bit less brittle. And in my opinion, this works quite well. Now let me demonstrate how you would set up the unit to begin with. You would connect your guitar here using a normal guitar cable. The first step would then be to set your volume slash gain knob. Zoom recommend that if your guitar has an active preamp, you set this to 12 o'clock and if it has a passive pickup, you would set it to 3 o'clock. You would then play your guitar and observe the signal present light. You want this to be green all the time. If it turns red, then you know your signal is distorted and you'd back it off. So, about there. So even on the loudest passages, I recommend that you have it such that the light always stays green. And this is a really useful feature to have. Now let's demonstrate the tuner mute section. When you press the tuner slash mute foot switch, the output of the unit mutes with the exception of the XLR output when set to pre-mode. You would then play a note and observe. As you can see, if you're in tune, the two center bars light up. If you're, for example, flat, it's to the left. And if you're sharp, it's to the right. 
The note is displayed here. You've also got a sharp there, so this is a full chromatic tuner. And when you're finished tuning, you would simply press the foot switch again, and your signal is restored. In use, the tuner has proven to be quite accurate and agrees with my guitar's onboard tuners. Now let's demonstrate the boost control. This boost control is designed to give you a bit of a bump in terms of volume for solos, as well as to even out the differences between strumming and fingerstyle. It has up to 9 dB of boost, but as you can see, there are no graduations around the outside to tell you where's 2, 3, 4, etc. All I can assume is that fully clockwise is 9, so presumably straight up and down is 4.5, this is about 6, and this is about 3. So here it is with no boost. And of course, you could also use it for soloing. Now let's demonstrate the anti-feedback control. One of the things about the anti-feedback control is that this switch is very, very small. So you'll actually have to bend down to the unit in order to use it. At the same time, it's quite effective. So I'll play a harmonic at the 12th fret to simulate feedback starting. And as you can hear there, it grabs the frequency quite effectively. Zoom don't give any information about how many filters it has and whether it clears the filters after a period of time. However, it does function fast and it's quite effective. Now let's demonstrate the reverb control. One of the things that you have to bear in mind when adjusting this is that the source presets contain some ambience already because remember they're trying to simulate the sound of a microphone so you need less reverb than you would with a straight non-modeling type of pedal so we're using an om style guitar and we're on the triple o preset which i find sounds best with this particular guitar so to begin with here is the sound with no reverb some reverb playing live I find this to be quite an ideal setting, but let's try a bit more.
now let's demonstrate the EQ section. One thing that I find a bit strange is that Zoom do not make any mention about what the EQ frequency centers are, nor do they say anything about the amount of cut or boost available. So it's very much a case of just using your ears to make the adjustments. To my ear, bass is around 100, middle is around probably five, 600, and treble is somewhere around two to four K, but I'm just guessing based on my experience. So once again, here is the sound with no EQ. So in my opinion, the EQ on this pedal is something of an afterthought. The bass is good if you want to add a bit of bottom end, but boost too much and it gets muddy. It's useful in the cut mode if you have a particularly boomy sounding acoustic. Middle, in the literature they say boost to increase the warmth, which I agree is quite effective and cut to increase the bite of the signal. So that's what leads me to think that this middle control is somewhere around five, 600 hertz. Treble boosting, in my opinion, leads to a kind of brittle sound, which is what you're trying to get away from in the first place. And cutting leads to either a warm or a muddy sound, depending on what type of guitar you're using. So I find the middle to be the most useful. But the nice thing is, because there is EQ built into the presets, I have found very, very little desire to adjust the EQ at all. 90% of the time, I'll leave it flat. I might cut a little bit of mid-range, but that's pretty much it. So the EQ is okay, and I find that you probably won't use it. So in my opinion, between the three Dreadnought presets, Dreadnought has the most bass, and as you go counterclockwise, you have less bass and more treble. 
So round shoulder, a little bit brighter, square shoulder, a little bit brighter still. Um, if you watch reviews of this pedal on the internet, people will say that the square and round shoulder presets are actually uh, work quite well for OM type guitars as well. I feel that sounds too bright for a dreadnought, that's <laughs> just my opinion. Now let's try a little bit of finger style, run through some of the presets. Carrying on, we have now an OM. This is a Takamine CP7 MOTT Thermal Spruce Top Oven Call Back and Sides. And this particular guitar, as you can see, it has no external controls. It has the Takamine Line Driver Preamp, which is internal and is not adjustable. So this will be a good test. Thank you. 
personally for this particular guitar, I prefer the triple O setting. And this makes sense because if you think about it, an OM and a triple O are both the same size body, right? The only difference being the scale length. So let's try sticking with this preset and let's add a little bit of reverb. Moving on down the size scale, we have a parlor guitar here. This is a Takamine CP3NYK, um, 12 fret small body guitar, um, cedar top, core, back and sides. So let's see how this guy sounds. First of all, on the microphone. Also pretty good in a different sort of way. So you can hear that Zoom have really, really done their homework on this and they have created something which I feel gives a viable alternative to using a microphone in live performance. Okay, and last but not least, look what I have here. Now I've had to zoom out to get the complete majesty of this wonderful instrument. This is a 1999 Tacoma Thunder Chief acoustic bass guitar. Now those of you who will know is this is one of the, the best acoustic bass guitars ever made. The one that I have here has the Fishman Prefix Plus EQ, which as far as I know is not specifically designed for bass and as a result never sounded any good.
Well everyone, that's our review of the Zoom AC2 Acoustic Creator Pedal. Thank you so much for bearing with me during this very long and detailed overview. I hope that it's answered all your questions and it's given you a really good idea of what this pedal is capable of. In my opinion, I think that Zoom has created a wonderful creative tool and also a way for people to get back towards that holy grail of being able to use a microphone during live performance on a loud stage. If you have any questions or comments, do please feel free to leave them below. I love hearing from my subscribers. And also let me know what you think about the whole topic of modeling, as well as use of pickups on acoustic instruments. Until the next video, I'm Bruno Luce. This has been GLB Productions. Take care, God bless you. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.